Hello everyone and welcome back to The Grim Chronicles. This is going to be week about my reading for the for the past week, which is week 49. And we're in week 50. Yeah, that's right. I finished one book. I finished um, this very short book, The Bookshop by Penelope Fitzgerald. Um, a very well thought of British novelist uh, who died, I think, in 2000, and Booker Prize winning novelist. Um, and so, yeah, Booker Prize winning novelist who, who uh, 19, 1916 through 2000 from Lincoln, England, and listed among the 50 greatest British writers since 1945. Very interesting career that started at the age of 58, which is my age. Uh, she started writing uh, biographies, including one of her father and uncle. And yes, I'm peering over at my source. And um, the only other book I read of hers is her last book, which is called The Blue Flower, and which was a very strange, but not bad, sort of fictional biography of the person whom I wrote my dissertation on, Novalis, Friedrich von Hardenberg, an early German romantic writer and sort of philosophical person. Strange choice for, for her to write on this person, but it was well thought of and I do kind of see her style. So this one is from 1978, a lot earlier, and it's about this young, this middle-aged woman Florence Green, uh, who opens a bookstore in a small town in uh, what apparently is East Anglia, England. So the sort of eastern part to the north, kind of the bump part of England, <laughs> so to speak. And she opens a bookstore in 1959 in this small town, a very small town that doesn't have a bookstore. And she opens it in this old sort of, it's called the old house, the small property that is you know kind of small and dark and damp and she she buys it up um and uh and and puts in her bookstore there and part of one of the sort of threads of the story is that it is uh haunted by a poltergeist uh whom they call the rapper and so i get i think i'm gonna i'm giving it four stars it's not a five star read for me so she's she's a very competent writer. She's she's a good writer, I would say even. Uh, but so my main issue with the book, so the main character is this young uh, middle-aged woman who's described as sort of wispy and petite and slight, uh, called Florence. And I think I mean it's a pretty basic issue I have with it is the fact that we never really. I never really get a sense of what Florence is feeling about what's going on in the moment. It's always it's very oblique. Everything is told to us in, in, a, in, a, in an oblique way. We kind of sense that she's not in agreement with what is going on, but we never kind of get her thoughts on things. And I guess I do kind of miss that in my, you know, um, it's very sort of, it's a weird book because it's sort of, Everything's on the outside, but yet not really on the outside, if if that sounds so strange to say. But I'm sort of thinking if someone from a different era, for example, one of my favorites, George Eliot, had written this book, we would be much more invested in the the really the the mean behavior that she is victim to in this little town, mainly from sort of this uh woman, this upper class woman who has designs on this building that she has occupied for her bookstore, uh, Gamart, Violet Gamart, I think is her name, G G Gamart, Violet, Mrs. Gamart. And she sets out to sort of bully her out of this bookstore. And um, it's kind of sad in that sense. You kind of sense that she's going to sort of persevere and she does persevere, but it's hard and there's just, there's a there's a strange coldness to to the style and to the writing that um did make make it you know lose a star for me and 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 even though it was an easy read it's very short it's only 124 pages 
it's just not ever going to be a favorite of mine for that reason. Um, I didn't really... I hate when people, I, well, I, it's not too strong to say I hate, but I dislike when people say they don't, they don't read on because they're not invested or they don't care about the characters. But there is something to that. You do have to be invested or care. Um, or at least, if not the characters, then something else about the style or something. So there's other ways of being invested in things, I think, other than characters. Um, and then we have, there's this young woman who helps in the store who's also very strange, <laughs> this young girl. Everyone's sort of very strange and uh, I think maybe... Fitzgerald is kind of making um, observations about English society in the, in the 50s and the 60s. And one of the sort of threads of the novel is that she, for the, the only time that bookstore does well is when she decides to sell the novel Lolita, Nabokov's Lolita. And it's a big hit, you know, because of the notoriety that it has received. And, um, but even that's sort of dealt with in as well, one thing about Florence is, you know, she's opening a bookstore, but she's not a reader and she's not really sort of interested in books. She's The reason she decides to open a bookstore is that she herself has experience with a bookstore. She's kind of, it's what she knows. But I think part of it is that she's a sort of realist or pragmatic type person and she, so she's not a reader. She doesn't really love books in the way that we all love books. And that's part of, you know, um the strangeness of her character i guess anyway so a four star read uh a quick read and i'm kind of glad i did it now i've had two i have two fitzgeralds what i might do the only other things i'm sort of interested in with fitzgerald are her non-fiction her biographies she apparently wrote as this page here says scholarly accessible biographies of the pre-raphaelite of the pre-raphaelite artist edward Byrne jones so that's that might be interesting so um yeah, but not a favorite. And the other book that I am listening to is absolutely amazing. And my thanks to Bert from Pastory Time for turning me on to this book by Steve Davis and Kavas Torabi, Medical Grade Music. So these are two British um, music aficionados. And Kavas Torabi is a musician. Well, actually, they're both musicians now. <laughs> It's it's a really funny story. Uh, so they both make so th um, it's a, a mu it's a book about their love of music and the kind of music that they love. Steve Davis. So I was kind of the first thing I did was to go to Google and figure out who the Steve Davis person was, and I kept sort of seeing this the the wiki page of a snooker champion. You know, I guess we call it billiards. Is that the same thing? I don't. I know very little about the sport. Pool, billiards, snooker. And he kept popping up. I was like, no, 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 I don't want that guy. I want the musician who writes a book with the other musician and they're in a group together. Turns out it is the snooker champion. Six times or five, you know, multiple uh, years of snooker champion. He's a he's a genius snooker player. And he, uh, in this sort of dual biography, he re account he re-, re he tells us about his love of music, and they both do. And they both kind of go, it's just this dual biography, the chapters switch off, and I'm listening to it, so I get both of their wonderful narrative voices. Um, they both write really well in a, quite a different way. Steve Davis is just very funny and wry and um, humble for someone who is a genius and who's made a lot of money playing snooker. I mean, if you read his Wikipedia page, he's, he's really, I mean... Um, it's an amazing career, but yet his his passion or his love has been prog rock music of a certain type. And um, and covers to Robbie, I have to kind of go delve more into the type of, well, I mean, in, through the chapters I'm hearing what he's interested in, but what, like his current career, I haven't really, I, do, I never have heard, of, I had never heard of them before. So, but, so we're finding out, um, just their love of music. And so Steve starts, I'm trying to, let me just pause it and see if I can get a, a, a table of contents. Okay, so I found the, the table of contents. And so this is a book for anyone who loves, who loves music, I mean, connected to any of these chapters. Um, and I guess you have to be someone, and I am someone like this, who is generally, open to a certain type of experimental or psychedelic music um, 
because a lot of people are not. It's a little bit similar to literary tastes too, or fictional tastes. If you, you know, if you're open to experimental fiction of a sort, then um, you can get excited about things that most people won't get excited. And part of I think the reason why they these two sort of soulmates have found each other is that they like music that most people don't like, or they really re they really like music who most people don't like. I mean, a lot of it is is. I mean, not all, it's not all like that. So the main, one of the main uh, um, groups or bands that uh, Steve Davis really, really likes, his favorite band in the whole world is a prog rock French group called Magma. And I had never even heard of them. And I've started listening to it. So the backstory for Magma is completely crazy. It sounds like, it sounds like L. Ron Hubbard, to be honest, but not really. <laughs> the, the, the sort of, this this stuff to do with a foreign planet, but but the music I actually do like. I do kind of, I do a little. I'm I'm not really at that level of passion for music, but but it's interesting to me. I'm kind of interested in music, and and so so he likes magma, and then um, he talks about man, gentle giant, so prog rock acts, um, more magma, someone called Charles Haywood. So we're getting into sort of more experimental, also a drummer. So he's interested in drumming, drummers, I guess. Charles Haywood, I was such, sort of looking at his biography today and some of his music is, is extremely sort of, it, you know, to, to a less refined ear, it's, it's hard to take, but it is still interesting. And then um, he's going to go on. And then at some point, they're going to start talking with each other, I think, in the chapters. So that really hasn't happened yet for me. And so that's Steve Davis, the snooker guy, who's a little bit older than me. He's 50, he's, a bit, he's like a couple of years old. He's in his 60s. And, um, and he really kind of makes you understand why he loves these bands and why, why... And it's sort of a mixture of why he loves them and how he kind of got to interact with them uh, it's just really well well written and then Kavas Torabi has a very interesting background Iranian uh, British person uh, and his terrible uh, plight going to this public school which in England means private um, and his band he starts out with Stray Cats who I do know of course Brian Setzer and then he has this big thing about Iron Maiden and so I mean, I've never been a metal person, so I'm coming at it from someone who's not into metal at all, but I sort of see his, I can understand it. And so, and then the next, his next group that, see, his chapters are sometimes a little bit sort of, so his next group is the Smiths, and I love the Smiths, or I did like them. Um, and they only kind of en enter into the chapter at the end, as same with the Frank Zappa chapter, where he talks mainly about his dealings with comics he likes comics and then at the end some person whom he likes and i also know very little about comics <laughs> someone at the end talks about uh says do you know frank zappa's music and he says no and that's the end of the chapter sort of so we don't really hear him listening to uh frank zappa that much and i sort of zappa was interesting he was around in germany because um he had a weird hit because people didn't understand the lyrics i don't think of bobby brown <laughs> and um yeah, Sheik Your Booty, that one. That's the only Frank Zappa that, because he was sort of, and that kind of led me, I kind of became somewhat interested in Zappa. Not not completely, but it was interesting. And it was a big deal in Germany. Uh, this must have been well before I came here, so in the 80s, I guess. Um, and his, so his Smith's chapter is interesting because, so when he went to see Iron Maiden for the first time, he was 12 years old and he had a great time and he loved them so much. And the audience was sort of, full of joyous energy for Iron Maiden. And then he describes two years later going to see the Smiths, whom he had come to love kind of in a roundabout way. He didn't really have this passion for them. And the people in the audience were much more combative. And so he says, Iron Maiden is singing about war and violence. And yet the, 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 the audience was very sort of peace, peace loving and friendly to this 12 year old kid. Whereas the Smiths, are to, you know, their songs are about being a vegetarian or being vegan. And um, and yet the the audience is extremely sort of um, volatile and unfriendly and and kind of aggressive in that post punk way. I thought it was really funny. And um, he's now talked about uh, this strange band called Voivod, Canadian prog rockers. That their music's also uh, it's. I mean, I love listening to him talk about it, but it's not really something that I'm going to go for. 
and um but it's a it's a really good book if you're interested in any in, in these and then there's chapters later on on pig floyd there's going to be chapters on the gr groups that i think tarabi is in cardiacs and gong there's a band something called surgeon i've never heard of them die laughing mix master morris i don't know who these people are henry cow i've kind of looked up their band that they have together the two writers is utopia strong there's a chapter on them and then it's going to end with XTC, which is interesting. Uh, something called The Gas Man. I don't know what that's about. And then the last chapter is Leonard Cohen, who I've also kind of appreciated, but have never really been that connected to. So that's kind of interesting. It ends with Leonard Cohen. So a really interesting book. And I would recommend it for anyone who's interested in any of these bands. And even, you know, if you just have a sort of slight interest, it's it's a great listen because they're both very talented narrators of their musical autobiographies. And so, yeah, those are my two big reads for this week. Um, not quite sure where I'm going to go. Uh, well, one thing I did today was I was reading around in the, I have a subscription to the Paris Review. And I started reading this one. I kind of started reading some of the stories and not finishing them, but kind of getting a sense of them. And some of them I like more than others. The first story is by this young writer who apparently very, very sadly passed away, Anthony Viasna So, whose book called After Parties was part of a bidding war. Um, and it's interesting, different, different uh, voice. Um, young so it, i feel with the all, a lot of the text in this in this edition of paris review is it is pulling me even against what i want into the 21st century of it's more modern stuff and and um some of the poems are interesting um i forget where this person's from this one poet is from he's from somewhere he's a good poem poet so I might come back and tell you a little bit more about this because my thoughts, as you can tell, are pretty much pr very preliminary. But I do like the artists that they're featuring uh, on the cover and in the inside too. Paige Ji Young Moon, a portfolio of, of um, uh, her work is very interesting. And um, yeah, so I think we're going to leave it at that. And yeah sorry for the kind of weird ending here hope everyone's doing well and i will talk to you next week Bye bye <laughs>